In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Hello, and welcome again to the Jesuit Post, and to Live the Questions, a Holy Week retreat in the Ignatian tradition. We are meeting now for the fifth time in our journey of making this Ignatius-inspired retreat. And today, we'll take on the third week of the spiritual exercises. The third week invites us to confront the passion of Jesus. It seems fitting to do this, as today is Good Friday, the day when Christians around the globe recall who Jesus was as Savior, what he did so that we might be with God forever. Over the past two days, we've been exploring the life of Jesus, this remarkable man who is the witness of God's kingdom at hand, the Son of the Almighty. We asked, how can this be? How can he be? How can it be that in such an unexpected, humble, messy, but miraculous way, God comes among us? How can it be that he, Jesus, lived more or less as we do, engaging the fullness of the contours of the human experience? How can it be that, like us, he took first steps and learned first words, experienced loss and built a prayer life, cared for his family and made his own friends? How can this be? Then, in accompanying him through various scenes that we find in the gospel, we uncovered just some of the incredible qualities he offered those he eventually served in his short public life of ministry. We tried to see how he sees people, how he carries himself, how he responds to the signs of the times and gives the strength to name what it is that we want in our relationship with him. We heard his question to Bartimaeus, what do you want? And we allowed Jesus to ask us that very same question, what do we want? Are we ready to answer him? Today, this Good Friday, we see where his life His human experience, his incredible ministry, his defiant and public way of challenging authority, and his boundless love for those who are discarded, where all of that leads him. We will walk with him on his path, and in doing so, offer three ways to consider our question for today. Surely, it is not I, Lord. That fateful question Judas asks Jesus at the Last Supper. A question that sounds like a statement, one saturated with disbelief and defiance. Surely it is not I, Lord. These three ways of considering ourselves in relationship to the passion are thus. We cause suffering. We experience suffering. And we accompany suffering. Cause, experience, accompany. We will together acknowledge humanity's role in prompting the passion of Jesus and in experiencing it, accompany Jesus through it as people of faith. Before I entered the Jesuits, I lived in Omaha, Nebraska for four years and during those years came to spend quite a bit of time at Tiger Tom's Pub, a bar and grill on the corner of 72nd and Military. It was A cheers of sorts. I'd walk in, the bartenders, especially this guy Ryan, knew my name, and perhaps Tiger Tom himself would be bellied up at the bar, offering a round of blackberry brandy to the lucky ones among us. So it seemed fitting that the night before I was to leave Omaha for good, I'd head to Tiger Tom's and eat one last pork tenderloin sandwich. A few friends met me, we had a laugh, I said my goodbyes, and I headed out the door. Just as I was getting into a cab to head to the airport, my friend John's wife, Emily, by then also my good friend, she ran out of the bar and gave me a big hug. She had tears in her eyes. They prompted tears in my own. And she said to me simply, I'm going to miss you. My life until that point, and even now, is full of comings and goings, arrivals and departures. I show up and I leave. And with this Jesuit life, our communities are in constant flux. Jesuits move out and move in all the time. 
The other day, some friends and I counted the number of homes that we'd occupied in our lifetimes, and my number was 20. A few years here, a few months there, and on and on. So in my mind, leaving Omaha was just the next move, the next great adventure. But to Emily, my departure meant something different. Our relationship was fundamentally changing, and she realized it. I did not. To be honest, I feel embarrassed to this day that I hadn't realized that situation more closely. I wish I had savored that moment more. I wish I were better at goodbye. The passion of Jesus starts with a meal, the Last Supper, friends sitting around and celebrating a religious feast, drinking wine and dipping bread into dishes. Perhaps it was a finer occasion than most of their dinner parties, but surely the scene was familiar to them. Sure, Jesus was a man on the move, and he even predicted his death on multiple occasions. But I have to wonder whether his friends really understood that that dinner was the dinner, the last meal. He broke bread and he gave it to them. Would they have been more attuned or amazed had they known? He blessed the cup and likewise shared it with them. They sang a hymn together, then they went with him to pray, but they could not stay awake. Did any of them know? Would any of them have acted differently had they known he was about to be taken from them? Would they have prayed as hard as he did in the garden? Would they have said their goodbyes? Would they have perhaps made Jesus feel less alone in that moment? My intention in telling you about John and Emily is to invite you simply to accompany Jesus in this painful moment to be attentive to every part of the story, to note the suffering, not to turn away from the wounds and the spit and the blood, to witness the hatred and the compassion of those surrounding Jesus, to apply our senses and use our imaginations in such a way that we see ourselves as somehow part of Jesus' exposed and exhausting experience toward Calvary. When I was a student at Loyola University Chicago, I spent a fair amount of time at Madonna della Strada Chapel. The chapel sits right on the shore of Lake Michigan, such that the main doors into the space are no more than 15 feet from the water's edge. Inside, one is immediately hit by the scent of incense and beeswax. The floor of the chapel, polished to a shine, is laid in beautiful stonework of geometric splendor. Stained glass windows cast a kaleidoscope of color across the space on sunny days, and behind the altar, a stunning mural of Jesuit saints and blesseds venerating Mary, the Queen of Heaven. On Good Friday, several years ago, Father Michael Garanzini pointed out the Stations of the Cross. Wrapped around the chapel like a golden ribbon, they told the familiar story of Jesus' journey on that Good Friday. Who among us, Father Garanzini said, hasn't fallen before? Who among us hasn't needed help carrying our burdens? Who among us hasn't been tried or accused? Who among us hasn't needed a kind word of encouragement and the cooling balm of a cloth pressed against our face? His invitation was simple, to see ourselves as inextricably linked to the story of Jesus' passion. We know that story not only because we hear it every year on Good Friday, but because we somehow live it. Remember, we cause it, we experience it, and we accompany those for whom the passion is a living reality. We cause it. Surely it is not I, Lord. Surely I did not cause this to happen to you. Surely I act in such a way that I ease suffering. But do I really? My Jesuit brother Steve recently reminded me of something a presenter shared with us years ago when talking to us about community and family life. This guy said, you will hurt each other. And of course, we do sometimes. We can be jerks to one another in Jesuit life. We sometimes say too much about a sensitive subject, critique one another's way of living, or offer a hard truth in the spirit of love, 
even if that truth is ugly. The question is, how will we respond to the hurt that we cause? How will we respond when we know our actions lead others to distress and hardship? Will we make excuses? Will we brush things away only to be locked in the vast recesses of our memory and opened again when we least expect it? Will we seek reconciliation? I'll spare you the intimate realizations of the pain I have caused others here, juicy as some of this insider drama might be, but I want you to know that I am certain I cause other people pain. I'm also certain that I have good intentions, but when I put myself in the scenes of the passion narrative, good intentions might not matter so much. Surely the disciples wanted to stay awake, but they could not. A big meal, a healthy pour of wine, a late hour, that drew them to the sleep that for any of us would so naturally come. Surely Peter wanted to shout his loyalty to Christ from the rooftops. He had done so countless times before. But in a moment of weakness and confrontation, Peter denied his friend three times. Surely the Roman guard charged with making sure Jesus was good and dead saw that something was different about him and when it was all over, realized what he had done. In this moment of retreat, it's important simply to recognize that we do cause suffering, whether through our direct actions or through our complicity in systems of injustice that cause harms to others, government systems, social systems, even church systems. We have to acknowledge this. Perhaps an image that helps is the image of Christ on trial, because we do put each other on trial, and an angry crowd around Jesus shouting, crucify him. Now, there are times when we certainly stand in defense of Christ. We are, by being here together, revealing ourselves as hopeful followers and not killers of the Savior of the world. But can we be honest with ourselves for a moment and remember, as we explored in the meditation on the two standards, that there are times when we choose pride, honor, and riches over Christ's way of humility, service, and even rejection for the benefit of God's kingdom. There are times when we're more like a Roman guard or a member of an angry mob than a tender friend or companion. It takes great courage to face this truth. Surely, it is not I, Lord, but it might be. We must recognize, though, that we ourselves also suffer, and greatly. We all take up our cross. We all walk a long path toward God, and for better or for worse, suffering is a part of that path. On the one hand, my life has been easy. I have always had the things I need, the result of many people's efforts to care for me, and my incredible privilege. In one sense, Comparing my situation to that of so many others around the world, I realize that I have it pretty good. But there's a problem in thinking about suffering in that way. If I can only name my gifts, my lack of suffering, in comparison to those who have it worse off than me, then not only do I insert myself in their experience for my own relief and benefit, I also fail to find any sort of union with anyone else who suffers choosing instead to dismiss or ignore the presence of suffering in my own life and always keep it at a distance. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin says this beautifully. He says that we are one after all, you and I. Together we suffer, together exist, and forever will recreate one another. The truth is, it's hard to be all of us. We have all known loss, we have all been afraid, I remember once during a particularly challenging month that I was almost paralyzed, frozen at my desk with no capacity to make it out of my rut. Would that no one suffer? Would that you and I never experience pain? Surely it is not I, Lord, not I who will suffer. A key way to encounter Christ in his passion is to remember that he suffered like we suffer. His passion, that moment of his deepest agony and pain, must serve as a moment for us to see ourselves in his story. As we continue deepening our relationship with Jesus, we can not only see ourselves in the mere humanity of Jesus as a living, breathing, biological creature. Everything we know, he knows. 
what he felt and saw and wept for, are things that we know deeply. We may not face crucifixion, but we face life, and life has a way of falling apart from time to time. I remember once at work, in this month, I was not having a good morning. I can't recall what was bothering me, but there I was at my desk, head in my hands, not even 9 o'clock a.m. A student that I adore, Amber, had a locker just outside of my office. And so nearly every morning, Amber would pop her head in and we would have a little chat. Usually we chatted about her, and that's how it should have been after all. I was the staff member there to provide her with any support that she needed, and she was the young person trying her best to thrive in spite of the adversity that she faced in her own life. On this day though, Amber, she saw this pain on my face. And she, being a remarkable young woman of faith, asked me to close my eyes. She asked me to take a deep breath. And then, like I had done for her before, she prayed for me. I was suffering, likely some pain caused by someone or something out of my control, and she saw me. She helped me move along and move forward. Surely it is not I, Lord. I am not the one meant to suffer. But surely it is me from time to time. Knowing that we cause and experience suffering, we might come to a third way of thinking about Jesus' passion, what I call the way of accompaniment. We see in the scenes of the passion a person, Jesus, who is largely abandoned, Indeed, he cries out to God, Why have you abandoned me? But remember the invitation to be attentive to the way of the cross. We come to see that there are those who accompany Christ in his passion. But surely it is not I, Lord. Surely I don't have to witness this kind of suffering. I just have to listen to the familiar story once in a while to remember what happens. Plus, not to get ahead of ourselves, Jesus' suffering already happened, and we know how his story ends. No. As Jesus' suffering was for us, his suffering continues so long as ours does. We share it with him. I have a small tattoo on my left bicep. Now, try not to be scandalized. A small tattoo of a Roman numeral 5 a gift from two friends in Chicago just before I left Chicago for good. For me, the numeral represents the fifth station of the cross, and specifically Simon of Cyrene. Let me explain. When I made the spiritual exercises several years ago, I was utterly taken aback by Simon of Cyrene. Scripture tells us that he was pressed into helping Jesus carry his cross by the Roman soldiers. We might interpret this to mean that Simon was forced against his will, and that he lacked some generosity in his act. Indeed, Simon is not included in the canon of Roman Catholic saints. But I didn't experience Simon that way. To me, Simon was someone who saw Jesus, and in realizing Jesus' struggle and strain, said something about how Jesus needed help. The soldiers heard Simon say this and retorted, Well then, you help him. So Simon did. Here's the verse in Matthew's Gospel, the verse that captures the entire journey to Calvary. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. To my read then, Simon was with Jesus the whole time. Simon accompanied him through the entire journey. Who knows whether Simon wanted to be there or not. The fact is, though, he accompanied Jesus. He carried the cross. He carried Jesus himself. And in my mind, when you go through something like that with someone, you don't leave and you don't turn away. How do we accompany others through their suffering? For about five months, I lived on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in southwestern South Dakota, a stunning landscape of golden rolling hills, big sky, miles and miles between towns. My work was largely pastoral, and I often spent whole days in the car driving to and from places dotted all over the reservation, bringing communion to people, running prayer services, and visiting the jails and the hospital. 
Every so often, I would take communion to a small retirement facility in White River, just north of where I lived. The routine was relatively simple. Offer a word of welcome, read a gospel passage, a brief reflection, some intercessory prayer, say the Our Father, and then give out communion. Then I'd leave. The whole thing took about 20 minutes. On one occasion, however, a breathless nurse's aide came up to me at the end of this service. She told me that I needed to say a prayer for someone who was dying. I wasn't a priest. I didn't have the capacity to offer the sacrament of the sick. And if I'm being honest, I had no clue how to pray for a dying person right in front of me. At that moment, I wanted to be anywhere else. But I was led into a small room, and the scene was strange. Two people, an elderly man and woman, were in two separate beds, both along the same wall, such that their bodies mirrored each other, almost like two conjoined people, at the tops of their heads. The woman was laboring heavily to breathe, and the man, who could not see the woman because of his restricted mobility, waved for me to come close to him. She is my wife, he told me in an aged, slurred voice. I think she's dying. I told him that I was happy to offer a prayer for her, but what he really wanted was to hold her hand. The beds were arranged in such a way that they could not be moved and their hands could not reach each other. And so he suggested, you take both of our hands like a bridge between us. I did just that, and for the next 15 minutes or so, he talked to his wife. He explained that I was acting for him in holding her hand, that my hand was his hand, that he was right there. She remained silent, but for the heaviness of her breath. He told her that he loved her, and he listed all the things they had done together in their lives. Kids, trips to the Rapid City Holiday Inn, a lot of joy. He told her that the family was coming soon, and eventually they did. A kind young woman, their daughter, thanked me for being there, and then she replaced me in holding her parents' hands. I offered a prayer at her request, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then I left. I drove away not thinking about how badly I didn't want to be there, or how lost and nervous I felt, or how inadequate my effort was but about how lucky I was to be with them, to see love manifest in that way, to be a mere handpiece of some kind of comfort that both of them needed in that moment. It isn't easy to face that kind of suffering, but I bet that you have done it before. The Gospels show us that people did this for Jesus. Simon carries him along and provides some relief, as does Veronica when she wipes the blood and the sweat and the tears away from Jesus' face. As do Mary and Mary Magdalene and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. As does Joseph of Arimathea. They all do their part. They do not turn away. Rather, they accompany intimately until Jesus is in the sealed tomb. How might we find ourselves accompanying Jesus in this way? Surely it is not I, Lord. Surely you don't need me to accompany you but surely he does. Remember though, we are free in this. We are free to try and cause suffering or not, to acknowledge our own suffering or not, to accompany others in their suffering or not. Do we respond to the invitation to accompany? My grandma Cain had a long life marked by a large family. Every year at Christmas and Easter, the entire group would make their way to her house. At Christmas, the uncles would line up behind the bar in her basement and watch on as those of us kids who were young enough would open presents. We'd sing carols, we'd eat a standard meal of ham paired with every kind of hot dish that you can imagine. My grandma Kane was a true matriarch, a strong, quiet woman who knew how to love. I had a cousin pass away in his 30s. And I remember the grade side service. I stood next to my grandma and noticed at one point that she had pulled out a handkerchief to wipe her eyes. 
I had the impulse to put my arm around my grandmother in that moment, but for some reason, I did not. A few years after that, my strong, quiet grandmother, who had been living alone in the country, needed more support. And so she moved into an assisted living facility. Old age was setting in, as it does. And my mother would frequently ask whether I would like to go and visit her. And I did go once in a while, but I remember turning down those offers to visit more often than not. I made excuses. She had tons of visitors all the time. What was one more person in the room? When some dementia set in for my grandmother, I would say, she may not even know who I am. The truth, though, the truth of why I didn't go is that I was scared. I was scared to see what it looked like for someone to come near the end of their life. She died when I was 23, and all these years later, I hold a deep sadness and regret for the ways that I failed to be a companion to her. I should have done more. This, I don't think, is the way. In my failure and struggle to accompany my grandmother, what happened? I may have caused her pain, which I never wanted to do, and I have suffered because of my own selfishness, a long and lingering lesson always in the back of my mind. The way of the cross. The way of the cross is our way. And the way through the cross is to face the reality of suffering. Not to turn away, but to see where Jesus is in the midst of all of it, and to come to know how we respond. Surely it is not I, Lord. But my friends, it is me. It is us. It is we who have the capacity to cause hurt. We usually don't mean to. Sometimes we do, but our capacity to feel the cooling salve of healing only comes when we ourselves can acknowledge how we contribute to the suffering in the world. It is us, we who ourselves suffer. We'd rather not suffer at all. We'd rather a world without pain, without heartbreak, without long journeys that end in despair. But remember, when we think of the times we've fallen, been accused, been beaten down, been made to bear a burden too heavy for our sometimes slumped shoulders, Jesus knows that suffering, and he joins us in it. It is us. We who try not to turn away from the suffering of others, who instead draw cooling water and wipe the face of one who hurts. We who can share the load. We who can witness the redemption of the suffering that we see. It is us. It is all of us. Take some time today to pray with Jesus and his journey with the cross. If you're up for it, take some time also to think about suffering about how you might cause it, about how you endure it, and about how you accompany others. Some scripture passages and questions for reflection are in the episode description below. Use any of it as you see fit. Tomorrow, on our last day of retreat, we will begin with Jesus in the tomb and confront what is sometimes called the Paschal Path. In anticipation of Easter Sunday, we'll remember how his story ends. And then finally, we will consider how our story might continue. Please join me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. 